Good morning, welcome to the vineyard. Come find yourself a seat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you. Got lots to do this morning, lots to tell you about. Uh, I do need some children for the first thing. If you click on, can you click on the to the eggs, John? Thanks. Eggs in the basket. Oscar is going to come down first because Oscar very, very kindly offered to do this for me this morning, didn't you, Oscar? Yeah. Do you know how this works? Should I, should I tell you? You have to choose one of the eggs that isn't broken in there. Yeah. So if you want to come on that side, choose one of the eggs. You got purple, you got pink or orange. You want purple? Yeah. Can you open that up? See, it breaks in the middle. If you pull that apart, there you go. That egg's yours. Yeah. And there's a joke in it as well. But you have to read the joke out. Or do you want me to do that? Do you want me to do that? Good, because this is my favourite bit of the whole morning. This is. It says, what did the Easter bunny say to the carrot? Nice gnawing you. There you go, you can keep that. Brilliant. And also, Nathaniel as well. Come on. You come around here. You've got orange or pink to choose from. What's your favourite one? No, blue's, that's broken. Or, I said orange or pink, and you, and you said blue. <laughs> oh, there you go. Right, the egg's yours, yeah. And the joke's ours. Can you read the joke out? How does an Easter bunny keep his fur looking good? How does the Easter bunny keep his fur looking good? Hairspray. Hairspray, of course it is. But I'm... Uh, right, click. Kids' quest today is that's last week's. What can a snow leopard not do? The only answer to that was roar. A snow leopard cannot roar, would you believe? And click this week's one is because it's a white egg. How many national flags around the world contain the colour white? So, of 195 nations, how many flags of the nations contain the colour white? If you know the answer to that, or you want to guess, and you're under 13, you can have a go at Kids' Quest. Uh, right, we've got a video because it's uh, Palm Sunday and the kids are going to do Palm Sunday and we're going to watch the video. The story of Easter, the triumphal entry. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town. You coming? And Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Eh, okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. Rock! He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done, so they cut palm branches and ran to see him. Huh? The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do, for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset 
and they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. So the people kept on singing, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, who is this? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry, just as God said he would many years before. Right, I'd love to have tested Jesus on that and see if they kept quiet, would the stones actually have kind of shouted out and cheered? I'm sure they would have done, but I'd love to have seen that actually happen. Uh, slide uh, six, John. Let's go through a few notices first. Shall we? Uh, warm welcome if you're new here. Come as you are. We love newcomers. Let's take a newcomers pack. We have travel mugs and we have kids' bottles, depending on the age of your family. And give us a feedback card. Let us know how you got on. And we want to know how we can do things better. Click. Uh, membership, come on Sundays, uh, join a small group. Small groups are generally closed for Easter, but there are some open. I'll run through those in a sec. Uh, serve on Sundays, and of course, give regularly. If you're a regular here, you know what to do with that. If you're a guest, just take a chocolate. Don't put any money in, because we'll be mortally offended if you uh, think we uh, want you here for your money. And then invite your friends. Click to one of these so every first tuesday of the month it's memory worship at the methodist church uh, they have a service especially for those who are struggling with dementia and their carers or anybody wants to go along you're very welcome to that two o'clock at the methodist church this tuesday uh click uh, and then good friday which is this week on friday we are at holy trinity which is the big church on the top uh, that you can see from just about every part of town uh, there is a joint service at 10 o'clock all the churches get together twice a year just to celebrate the fact that we are unified as christians and we're all meeting at holy trinity at 10 o'clock on friday everybody welcome click and next sunday uh easter sunday here uh we have an easter egg hunt it's general uh, stuff that we'd normally do on a sunday uh, so there will be worship there will be a talk there'll be kids events uh, there isn't a specific kids work but we will have kids activities here uh, so invite your friends to that and then on the 30th we're doing lego church we've been toying with this idea for ages because april is a five sunday month we're going to try out lego church on the 30th that's here uh, um, in four weeks time click uh that's all the groups we do click through from that one so no bible group but big bible group this week uh there's a youth opportunity youth work opportunity come up at bar and bus if you want to apply for that uh speak to jamie or die uh it's also online and we can send you i think the email's gone out as well for that one to everybody on our email list if you want to see more about that give us a shout click and vineyard college as well they're doing open mornings and open evenings uh, for Vineyard College, which is basically if you want to study, you want to become uh, a, a, you want to kind of develop your Christian leadership, uh, you can attend, I think it's once a month through the year uh, on a Thursday, you can attend Vineyard College. Some of that's online, but if you want to know what it's about, you can actually uh, go on one of the open days. We just missed one of them, which was last week. There's another one coming up 30th of May, but if you're interested in that, give us a shout and we'll give you more details. Uh, click. Are we going on to another one? Oh no, it was on now. Cool. Uh, Laura, do you want to come talk about the email we got yesterday? No, you can do it. <laughs> She's going to walk off. Uh, so some of you will know that we have been praying, pursuing, weeping uh, over your gnashing of teeth, trying to get a building. Um, and yesterday we had confirmation that we have acquired one. <laughs> so we have a building. Uh, so yeah, we need to sign the paperwork, uh, but we have said that we are happy to proceed. It's extremely, um, promising it's very it's in a great location so it's actually back near Swain uh, but they are building a huge housing estate down there 
and there is no community facilities other than a field. Um, so enter Rayleigh Vineyard. Um, so we are really, really excited, and it's going. We think we think it's going to happen quite quickly, as like we're talking weeks, maybe six weeks, and we might be in. Uh, so it's absolutely amazing, but we need your prayers and we need your support and uh, there's going to be some kind of physical jobs that need doing because we're actually going to have to move some things. Um, but there's also quite a lot of excitement because it's a base. Finally, we will have a base to do things. So we also want to do uh, at some point like a blue sky thinking dreaming, vision casting, what would you like to use the building for? There's lots of things that we are going to use it for anyway, but if you're thinking, oh, I've always wanted to do a, whatever, ax throwing class. No, Adrian, we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, you know, then that, that's the kind of thing that there are some possibilities to do some community events. So um, we're really excited. We're, I know that there are a number of you in here that have been absolutely uh, praying this through and have been working behind the scenes and doing all kinds of things uh, to make this happen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but this is the first huge step in what's going to be quite an exciting journey. Um, we're family, so we wanted to share this with you guys this morning. So exciting, exciting. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Di, where did Di go? Come on up here. Let us know what you've done over in the corner for people to enjoy. Hello, good morning. I um, had a little bit of God inspiration and thinking about Palm Sunday a lot and how I was going to share it with my kids. And um, I, God just showed me what I already had at home. So over here, we've got like a little walkway of Palm Sunday. So it's not just for the kids. If you want to take your shoes off and just go for a walk, um, pause for a moment and just think about what this moment meant and what it would have felt like for everybody else who was there. Um, there are just some little pointers on the leaves as well. If you want to write on the leaves, if you want to colour one of them in, um, if you want to take one home, whatever, do whatever you feel God inspires you to do. But by all means, please take part. That's brilliant. I never thought about that. Palm Sunday is a very exciting walk, isn't it? It's a lovely way of describing it. Uh, right, should the band back, band up? And we're going to worship. Why don't you stand up uh, and we're going to pray and uh, Laura's going to lead us in worship. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for exciting news, Lord. We thank you for um, just a, a day to celebrate. Every day is a day to celebrate, Lord, but the fact that it's Palm Sunday as well and just the king coming into his city, the king coming into his place where he should be worshipped and adored, Lord. And although we know lots of things happened in the following seven days, Lord, we just uh, stand with that crowd, Lord, now welcoming you into our gates, Lord. We will enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, Lord. And just know that we can just really, really easily walk into your presence lord we can stand next to the donkey with a with a palm frond we can wave it in your face if we want lord just to show you how excited we are lord and even the stones around us lord even the inanimate things are praising as well we may not be able to hear them lord but the walls of this building are praising you as well as we sing thank you jesus You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great life you 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your Beginning, 
One with God the Lord Most High Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you How Christ, what a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name. Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil told Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. You have been raised to life again. You have no rival. You have. name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Death could not hold you, the veil tore before. Then the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you have been raised to life again. name it is nothing compares to 
to this what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus Panic Kids is now open. If you are in that age bracket, Led me to the cross, and I saw the face of mercy in that place of love. It opened up my eyes to believe your sweet salvation where I'd been so blind.
Jesus, just such very, very strong words in that last verse, Lord, that it's very difficult not to <laughs> express ourselves, to react, uh, to get excited, to feel deep shame, everything, Lord. Um, and just as we approach your Holy of Holies, 
uh, on this beautiful Palm Sunday, Lord. We just remember that. We remember the excitement of Palm Sunday, Lord. We remember the, the devastation of Good Friday, Lord, and remember the exhilaration of Easter Sunday. Uh, and just really plant our hearts in your lap, Lord, our, our, our bodies in your way, Lord, our hands in the air in front of you, Lord, that we can really let you know how we feel about this. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Just as a continued act of worship, I'm just going to invite you to um, get involved in what Di's done over there. So it says, take off your shoes if you want to, uh, sing, dance, pray, or simply walk across the steps um, and acknowledge God and give thanks. And there are some activities on the leaves as well. So just for the next five or ten minutes, if you want to get involved in that, you'd be very welcome to. So I'm going to take my shoes off and join in. If you're youth, uh, youth is about to start upstairs. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My
Thank you, band. I said I'd try not to cry this morning, but I'm very proud of my daughter. Uh, I might want that a bit higher. Uh, right, one notice missed. Uh, Grab every sorting group is this Tuesday at the offices, eight o'clock. Uh, that will be, uh, although it's half term, it is the Tuesday, it's meant to be the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, so if you're in the Grow, Grow Baby Small Group, go along to that. Uh, and then on next Sunday, we don't have a specific rotor, so it's everybody gets to play uh, on Sunday. So please come along, if you're intended to come along, if you turn up at 10, then help out with everything that needs to be done, setting up and coffees and stuff, that would be brilliant. Uh, and we can set up church, uh, all of us in together. So as it's a five week month, we are a little stretched, shall we say. Uh, right, um, John, can you click on slide 16 for us, please? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Big Bang Theory when Howard goes into space as an astronaut and he comes back and all he can talk about <laughs> is space and everything about what he did and everything, every, every subject that comes up, he, he twists into a story about when he was on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the space shuttle, whatever it is, the uh, space station. Uh, that's what it's like with me in Peru. I've been back now for nine days and I can turn any conversation into a story about Peru. So I'm going to finish off today. I'm going to talk about Peru now. and I'm not going to talk about it ever again unless you ask me. OK, so I'm just going to get it all out of my system now. OK, I want to tell you how I ended up in Peru and a couple of things that happened there just to uh, bless you and to boost your faith and to encourage you that, you know, uh, our faith is a global faith and other countries uh, actually do lots of things better than we do when it comes to Christianity, not surprisingly. Um, so uh, I've kind of entitled this uh, Peru where God smiles most because their smile is unbelievable, the Peruvians, uh, it really is amazing. Uh, it's like God smiling on you when, they, when their faces come alight. Um, but really about kind of how I ended up in Peru, what, what, how I got there and what happened when I was there. So the whole story started in 1977. Um, I was quite into, uh, very keen uh, on musicals, as Ollie is, uh, as he's grown up. But I really liked Joseph and the Technical and Dreamcoat. I really liked Jesus Christ Superstar. And then uh, Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice pulled out uh, Evita. Um, which is very different from the first two, but I absolutely loved it. Just the music and just the setting, uh, just the whole concept of what it was about and just the whole story about a whole nation was gripped by this woman who was flawed uh, and the music was great. And I just had this, like, like just something hooked me inside about South America. Um, and it's been, kind of been ticking along for the last uh, 40 odd years uh, in, in my heart as to what to do about this, but never really kind of like, never really pressed that pedal to get into it. Uh, ten years later, I was in a church, my mum and dad's church in Raynham, and they used to have a vicar and then two curates to, to cover all the services across the parish. Um, and one of the curates was a guy called Greg Venables. Uh, he was actually Terry Venables' cousin, and it was about the time that Terry Venables was um, uh, England manager. So it's kind of a great superstar came into our, our, uh, our church, and he was one of the curates there. Uh, but he had been the Bishop of Bolivia. So he'd been, because the Anglican Church wasn't big in Bolivia, but he'd come back from South America with all these stories about what life was like there. And it just kind of really piqued my interest and really kind of got me going. Uh, his wife, Sylvie, she was a dead spit of Judy Murray, Andy Murray's uh, mum. And she taught a lot of my friends to speak in tongues. And we had a, a youth group or like a, a young, a young adult, adults group. A lot of them started speaking in tongues and it just blew my mind kind of what was going on down there in South America and what they brought back. Um, around about the same time, we had a, a, an Argentinian evangelist come to our church to stay with us for a couple of weeks called Agustin, a really sweet guy. I don't know how you feel about kind of other countries that are kind of England's sworn enemies, but countries like after the Falklands War, everything was anti-Argentina. Every time we play the Germans, it's like everything's anti-German. But I know loads of uh, um, uh, Argentinians, I know loads of Germans, and they're lovely people. I don't know where we get this idea that the Germans are a hated sworn enemy. Well, I don't know where we get it from, from the uh, Second World War. But uh, you know, these days, I know loads of lovely Germans and loads of Argentinians, all that kind of stuff. And it's just really, really nice. And he was a really sweet guy. And it just really stayed in my memory. So this guy was from Argentina and he was from South America and he was an evangelist. And again, it's one of those things that just kept ticking along. And during, during the kind of like the, the last 40 odd years, it's just been every now and then God's nudged me a little bit closer to South America. Fast forward to uh, 2019, four years ago. 
Uh, my bosses at the time, Chris and Maggie Parsons, uh, who are up in Suffolk, uh, they asked me to go to Peru with them to go on this trip, this um, mission, mission ministry trip to, to Peru, um, which turned out to be the one we went on this year, four years later. Um, it, at the time, it clashed with the commissioning of Jim in Kakodi when we planted Kakodi Church up in Scotland, uh, and it was also Oliver's 14th birthday. So I can't, I, I had to back out and put it to back in my mind, didn't think about it. And then last October, a couple of the guys that had taken over the whole ministry to Peru said, well, why don't you come? You were interested last time, why don't you come along? And I felt I'd kind of run out of excuses to say, <laughs> to say no to this thing. It's one of those things I'm thinking, I really want to go, but I'm scared stiff about going all that way on a plane, some petrified of flying, just thinking about, you know, what, what am I actually letting myself in for? But I felt like I couldn't say no anymore, and I really wanted to do it. Half of me wanted to do it, and half of me wanted to run screaming uh, away from these guys. Um, but I, I kind of sensed that it was going to be as good as I thought it was going to be because I've been waiting 40 years to go. Um, I knew it was going to be good. Uh, and I don't know how kind of quite quite how to explain that in that um, you know how I don't know how you feel God speaks to you, but there's some things God says to me, and I don't even realise He said it. And then over the years, something kind of nudges me towards that subject again, and another little nudge, another little nudge. I think, oh yeah, God's been saying that over the past you know forty odd years. So all those things came together in that one decision to go. And obviously, I had to talk, talk to Laura about it, and she wanted me to go more than I did. <laughs> so I thought, well, I can't really argue with that, can I? So. I was say I'm petrified of flying. Um, there was a moment on the we flew out with KLM from Amsterdam, and there was a moment on the plane where I was. Could you walk? You can walk around this plane. Uh, it's 400 people on this plane, 10, 10 seats wide, uh, so it's like a little kind of village, um, and you can walk around when you get a little bit kind of tired for a 12-hour flight. And I walked down to the back of the plane. There was like toilets down the back, and as I stood kind of waiting for the loo, I'm standing here, and there's um, there's like a there's the, the door. The door to the plane is there. Now, generally speaking, if you're petrified of flying, you don't go anywhere near the doors because they could, at any moment, they could fly open, couldn't they? So I'm standing by the door thinking, please hurry up in the loo, please hurry up in the loo, I was going to do it here, I'm going to do it here. And I, I, thought, I thought to myself, okay, I'll try and relax, try and relax, see what's around me. So I looked around and the, the windows in the plane are kind of like, uh, as you sit down, they're kind of head height, aren't they? But the, the window in the door was right down in the kind of the corner of the door like that. So I looked down and all I can see is like 30,000 feet below me and like nothing. I think I had a real panic thinking, <gasps> I had to really, really rein it in, get into the, the toilet and try not to scream my head off. But just those moments of like, what am I doing here? I'm 30,000 feet up on a plane to Peru. Why am I doing this? Uh, why South America? Um, um, there's another thing, one of the, another one of the nudges along the way was when uh, Vix went to uh, Mozambique uh, to go and see Ruth a few years back. And I was very, I was so impressed by what she did because she'd never been out there before and it was a real kind of brave thing to do. And I thought, oh, maybe I should do something like that. But Africa's never really kind of like drawn me in that way. Never really wanted to go to Africa, never wanted to go to Asia, never wanted to go to the States really. But South America's always held that kind of like thing in my head thinking, oh, it just intrigues me, it's just something about it. But I I'd thought it was going to be Argentina, God was going to ask me to eventually, but it happened to be Peru. Not, not sure why, other than who I met in Peru. Uh, you know, apart from Paddington, I didn't know anything about Peru whatsoever. And if you go to Peru, they don't know anything about Paddington either. It's a very British thing. So my friends Martha, uh, Mark and Arthur assured me I was going to love it, um, uh, but they really underestimated that fact, really, because it was just—it was so good out there. It was so amazing. I had ten unbelievably blessed days, so much better than I'd anticipated. It was fantastic. Apart from the fact I'd missing you and my family and my dog, uh, it was really, really, really it was a fantastic trip. The flight was, as I said, was twelve hours long. It's ten thousand kilometres from Amsterdam to Lima, and I'm thinking, they're thinking, why is no one else screaming that we're thirty thousand feet up in this metal, you know? metal coffin flying to our deaths but everyone says everyone else seems to take it kind of completely normally i spoke to uh, jane and adrian just before i went and jane said oh it's the safest form of flight don't worry about it it's, you know, you'll be you'll be fine and adrian said but if you're gonna have an accident you're gonna die he says great thanks that's what we need to hear wasn't it <laughs> if anything goes wrong you're gonna die up there <laughs> Uh, on this, so on this 12-hour flight, I was assured by my friends, Mark and Arthur, it never rains in Peru. It's the second driest, in Lima, sorry, it's the second driest city in the world after Cairo. And if you've been to Cairo, you know how hot and dusty it is. Lima is the second driest city in the world. So we arrive at the airport. 
walked out of the airport. Really heavy, blobby, warm rain falling from the sky. They had, they had a cyclone in Chile, uh, and it kind of it was at the the tail end of the cyclone had come up to Peru, and it just caught Lima. So literally, we, we walked out from the the uh, the, the uh, airport into this rain, and it was hot, hot rain, and it was really blobby and it was really heavy. And I looked to the guys and thinking, said to them, you know, what what's going on here? What on earth are we talking about? Uh, this is the this is the road coming back from. Lima. So this is we were driving through this. This is about a foot deep. We were driving through this because there's no drains. They don't need drains because it never rains in Lima. So whenever it does rain, all the water just runs straight down the road. It's uh, quite bizarre, really. And the roads, uh, the roads in Peru are just just something else. My, my, I feel like now, now I've gone to Peru, my life is kind of divided into two halves. I've got that kind of like the 50 odd years before Peru, and now I've got hopefully 50 odd years after Peru. I feel like it's defined something in me, BP and AP. Uh, and uh, before Peru, before I went there, I get stuck in contraflows around because I've done if you've noticed, but the, the potholes in the road after the dry summer are literally everywhere. You can't go from where we are in Rayleigh to South End without kind of stopping at two or three contraflows. Thankfully, the government is good enough to fill them in. Not so much in Peru. They just don't do that. The roads are just left to what they want to do. So I will never, ever complain about a pothole in the UK again because I've been down Peruvian roads. Literally every 10 yards, they're slowing down to drive around a pothole. And that's not just the, that's not the minor roads. That's the major roads as well. Very, very, very different way of doing things. It didn't occur to me, after talking about the rain, it didn't occur to me until I rang Laura the following day and told her about the rain that it might possibly be prophetic, the rain. I hadn't twigged on that at all. But the first night we were there, we had my Arthur, Arthur's daughter was with us. Arthur is the guy that leads uh, Plymouth Vineyard. Uh, and his daughter was with us, he's 20 year old. And she had a dream in the night about a river and the river was kind of flowing down and nothing was getting in, in its way. It was, and all the pebbles and all the stones in the river were kind of like being uh, kind of honed and uh, shined and kind of like all the corners being knocked off. They were being kind of smoothed by this river. And she, she has prophetic dreams every now and then, so she told us about it. And it just seemed tonight to link in with what we were doing. It was like a river was coming through uh, the, what, what we were doing, and it wasn't going to be stopped. The Holy Spirit was going to kind of completely f flow through that. And we just linked this to the rain. The fact that he got there, it hadn't rained for five years, walk out of the airport and it was raining. It just felt like God was doing something. Not that we are anything special or we were anything amazing to walk into Lima and suddenly everything goes right, but just that fact that it was kind of something symbolic was actually happening. And we realized we were bringing something into that place that was actually going to change a few things. The point of going to uh, Peru was to look at, to go and help some of the uh, uh, vineyards there. Uh, click, next one. Uh, this is the, can you see, oh, yeah, I am in this picture actually. This is me in the back of the picture. Wearing my uh, Mr. Grumpy t-shirt. It was Red Nose Day this was when this picture was taken. I had a Mr. Grumpy Red Nose t-shirt, which was very confusing to the Peruvians. I didn't quite know what to make of it. Uh, but the point of going out there was to link up the six vineyards that are in Peru and trying to encourage them to work together, trying to encourage them to think about church planting and increase what God's doing. So 10 years ago uh, in Peru, the USA started planting churches from America into Peru. So, so Peruvians had gone to stay in America, gone to a vineyard church, like what they saw, think I can do that, go, go, back, go back to Peru and do that in, in, my, in my city. So they'd come back to Peru and started a, a, a church. It's the same had happened in the UK. We'd invited some people over to the National Leaders Conference and they'd gone back to Peru and planted churches. Same thing had happened in Costa Rica. So you've got these vineyards uh, springing up. Uh, uh, and we spent three days trying to get the various, par various pastors to talk to each other on a similar kind of subject to get a kind of consensus of what they thought they should be doing together. So the idea is to go in there and encourage them to run the show by themselves. If they're always looking to kind of like, you know, dare I say the UK overlords, which is a horrible phrase, but you know what I mean by that. It, you know, it, it doesn't work. It's like it going back to colonial days. You want to go back to the colonial days when we went into a country, ravaged it, and then, you know, stayed around to, to make all the laws. We want them to, to form it by themselves. So uh, so this is Mark and Louise from Suffolk. Uh, where's Arthur? That's Arthur from uh, Plymouth. That's me, obviously. That's Artur from Costa Rica. He's a lovely guy. He was our interpreter. He was uh, worth his weight in gold, he was. Uh, and all the others are Peruvians there, are various Peruvian churches. So I want to get a consensus of opinion as to what they thought they should be doing when they got together. So like a common script, if you like. 
and also kind of what they thought they needed to be able to work together in the future. There'd been a few kind of like issues because some have been planted by America, some have been planted by the UK, some have been planted by Costa Rica. It was a little bit, it's been a little bit of a mis mismatch over the past 10, 12 years. And we're trying to get them to kind of to agree what they think a vineyard church look like, looks like in Peru, and then to work out how they do uh, conferences together, how they connect with each other, how they share resources. Because the bigger you get, the more you need Dare I say the word hierarchy? I don't mean that, but that, that's the closest word to it. They need, they need a structure to know how to work together as a vineyard movement in the UK, uh, in, in Peru, the same way we did that 30 years ago in the UK. So 30 years ago, you had uh, someone planted in London, two churches planted in London, one in Manchester, one in St Albans, and they'd all come from different countries outside. So they had to talk to each other as it grew, as we decided how we were going to kind of uh, bless the vineyard movement. We finally got an agreement on paper after three days. Everyone agreed to it. Everyone signed it, including me. So they had a starting point. And that remains to be seen now where we go from there, because that's a good starting point, but we need to actually work that through. So we had three days of thrashing out this policy, this Peruvian partnership policy. The next six days were all about people. So the last six days we were there, all about people, just getting to know them, visiting their churches. We visited five different services in the next four days, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and this, I don't know if you've ever been to like a, a church in another country or a vineyard in another country. There's just something different about it. You know, I love what we do here. And the UK has a very particular kind of brand of, uh, you know, of um, vineyard. But you go to another country and they've got a slightly different brand of vineyard. I mean, the worship there was just amazing. To hear vineyard songs that, that we know of, that we've got, that they're written in English, being sung in Spanish. Something about the Spanish language is just beautiful and the way, they, way it flows through, the, through, the, through the, uh, the verses and stuff and the choruses. And just the way they sing it, like, just seems to bring a different level of the Holy Spirit along. Really, really lovely. I can kind of really recommend it. If you want to go and visit another country, go and visit a vineyard in another country. Two stories I want to tell you about that epitomised my whole stay there. Two things that were so, for me, so really, really life changing. Uh, the first was uh, Guillermo, this lovely guy here. Uh, now, he was the one that wasn't getting on terribly well with other churches. He'd been planted by a different country to some of the others. And uh, that was part of the issue. He didn't quite fit in with the rest of the group. So it was important that we felt that we visited him at his home church. Uh, and he planted uh, a church in Laderas, which is uh, to the north of Lima. Uh, and then he'd left that with a couple that were also also there. Um, these guys, Israel and uh, Liliana. And then he'd gone to plant another church in, I think, I don't know if it was a place called Casa de Jesus, or if it was a church called Casa de Jesus. Ca Casa de Jesus means Jesus house or house of Jesus. So it's either the, a town called that, or it's his church was called that. Not quite sure. It was an hour and a half to get there. And it was an hour and a half back. So it wasn't an easy journey. And when you think about the roads, the roads are like you're bouncing along all the time. I counted 73 speed bumps on the way there and 70, oh, more than that on the way back. They look so kind of little better than dirt tracks, really. And we got to, this is a Monday evening, this was, uh, the, the trip. A taxi picked us up. We didn't know the driver. Uh, and it just reminded me of those stories you hear from Mexico where tourists go for like a, you go get into a taxi, you know, go off to a kind of a, a, an offbeat uh, place somewhere. And then you find they've been, you know, killed somewhere two days later thinking, oh, anything could happen here. And I, mean, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know how safe this is. I don't know how safe this city is. We're getting in this taxi. He couldn't speak a word of uh, English. We had very broken Spanish. So it was quite kind of difficult kind of getting any, any conversation going. 10 minutes down the road, we stopped at a petrol station. I think I've got a picture of it. Click. Yeah, this petrol station here. Yeah, I thought I'd take a picture of it just in case I needed to leave a trail for the police. In case, you know, I think they're going to find, find my phone. At least I know where I've been. Um, and we stopped at this pre uh, petrol station and um, he asked us to get out of the car. I'm thinking, oh, I've seen pictures like this where you're like, like grainy kind of videos of like, you know, you see someone getting out of the car, they, they kneel down head and they get a bullet through the head or something think anything could happen now but apparently that's what you do in peru at the service station you stop for petrol everyone gets out and walks around to stretch their legs it's just one of those things um say so, and then we got back in the car and got away uh, back to uh, to uh, casa de jesus for a very bumpy 90 minute journey um after an hour so an hour and a half journey after an hour we pull up in this quite posh neighborhood and i'm thinking 
oh, this is quite nice, not too shabby. We're going to get out, we're going to stop here, we're going to do, do the church here. Uh, so Arthur and I got out, and because we don't know any Spanish, didn't know what he was saying to us, we got out and started walking a little way, a bit way up the road, and this couple appeared from nowhere and got into the taxi, and I'm thinking, oh, hang on a minute, no, the taxi is for us. You can't get in a taxi and go somewhere else. I mean, you may need, may need, the, you know, may need the job or something, but this is our taxi. And he was kind of talking to them as though he knew them, thinking, this is a bit weird. It happened to be that one of the guy, there was a woman, guy and a woman there, the guy was their interpreter for Casa de Jesus, and the woman was the worship leader. We didn't have no idea who they were. They're getting in the, ca- in the taxi, and the taxi wasn't big enough for four passengers, so we're kind of like this in the taxi. People had never met before. Thankfully, the interpreter spoke fluent English, so we could talk to him, gave me his life story in the next five minutes. Lovely, lovely guy, uh, but quite chatty. Um, so again, one of those things, I'm thinking, I really don't know what's going on here. I really don't know where we are at. Um, and we carried on through Lima. Uh, and the thing about Lima is the higher you get in Lima, the higher you go up in the mountains, the poorer it gets. Because when the Shining Path were doing their thing, which is one of the terrorist groups in the 1990s, uh, in, the, in the hills, all the people that were kind of dislodged by that or dis, um, um, uh, kind of moved out moved out from their homes they all came into the city and the only space was on the hills so they've all gone up the hills and the land was all free so they went up there and they planted all their their, their uh, places up there so anywhere you go up high generally it's a little bit poor than in, poorer than the, in the city so we're driving higher and higher and higher getting more and more remote getting further and further away from the city um, still not sure where we're going still not sure who this guy is driving who who and who, still not sure who, who we picked up 10,000 kilometers from home, don't speak the language, thinking, I am so far out of my comfort zone here. I'm not even sure I'm going to get back to this, you know. We arrive in this place. Uh, this is the place here. You can't, I didn't get very many good pictures of it, unfortunately. It's just a little further here. But this is the Pacific Ocean uh, sunset. I didn't quite get the picture I wanted to, but I've always wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. And the fact that just before we got there, we were going through across this bay with the sunset over the, the uh, horizon with the Pacific Ocean was just like, it was just one of those God moments thinking, if I don't see anything else in this trip, God, it's worth it just for that. It's just absolutely amazing. And we get to this place, uh, Guillermo's there waiting to welcome us in. in, welcome us in. It's not his home. Uh, it's a small uh, shop come house uh, in the middle of this, uh, this village, probably about the size, probably in the classrooms upstairs, it's about the size of one of the classrooms. Uh, there's 25 of us in this room, including six kids. One half of the room is a sweet shop. The other half of the room is a hairdresser's and it's, and it's their home as well. It's, it's that kind of place, you know, the, uh, the, the, the way that they do their shopping, everyone, everyone has a little shop, a little corner shop. You get very few supermarkets out there. They will go to the local corner shop and get things. Turned out that Casa de Jesus was the name of the church, the name of the small group that he's planted. Um, quite a poor kind of crowd that had come to, to, uh, to, to see us, but the Peruvians are super, super friendly. They all want to know who you are. They want to know if you've had lunch with the Queen and were you at a funeral, all that kind of stuff, you know, because that's the only thing they see of England, that kind of thing. And it turns out that the driver of the taxi was Guillermo's brother. And he'd asked him to come and pick us up all the way to the other side of Lima, which was very, very, very kind of him. I'll go on to that in a sec, why it was so kind of him. Uh, Abigail, who's the woman that came with us in the car, she starts leading worship. Uh, and she's quite a kind of a hippie kind of girl. She starts explaining why, why she'd, she'd written this song. She was going to sing it, sing it with us. And she started playing, explaining it, and she's doing it in Spanish. And I kind of get in a little bit of the interpretation, but it did go kind of on and on and on, thinking, okay, when are you going to get to the song? And she starts playing this song, which the, uh, the, the, the chorus line was, Holy is the Lord. And it's just beautiful the way she sings it and the way they kind of all join in. And it's like, oh, that was really worth waiting for. So it over, over, immediately kind of lifts you into a place where no matter what you're thinking about, how dangerous it is, you're in a place, you're in a safe place with God. It was absolutely wonderful. And they tried to get the words of the song up on their TV. They've all got it, no matter how poor they are, they've all got kind of 15-inch TVs in, in, in their houses. I don't know why. They've got great cars, great phones, great TVs, and literally nothing else. It's really, really strange. Uh, but they, they had the big, big TV on the wall. So they gave the remote to uh, Guillermo's daughter, who was there, and they said, can you find the words? I assume they're saying, can you find the words on the screen? So she flicks through like the different things on the channel. They've got some kind of computer thing going on as well. And she flicks through, and Peppa Pig comes on the TV. 
I'm thinking, this is weird. I'm 10,000 miles from in this thing. And, I, you know, and it's, it was Peppa Pig in English with subtitles. So I'm actually watching Peppa Pig. And it was the episode where she goes to meet the Queen, the famous one from the, from the Jubilee seven months, nine months back. Really, really strange kind of thing. And eventually they found the words and we could sing the song. It was fantastic. As we uh, got through the evening, the worship was fantastic. Um, Arthur, the guy with me, gave his testimony and it got translated into Spanish, which was brilliant. Uh, and then we started some ministry time. Guillermo asked us if, he'd pray, if we'd pray for some people. He got us all to stand up. And I noticed this girl by the door. One of the things I found in Peru was the amount of times I cried, I've cried more times in Peru than I've cried probably in the last 10 years. It's like every day I found something to really, really grab me. Um, there was a little uh, girl, there was a, a young lady um, sitting by the door. She was kind of half in, half out, wasn't quite sure where she, she should be there. Uh, looked a little bit kind of poor by her by her, her outfit. Uh, kind of got the feeling she was maybe not hadn't been coming very long. Wasn't quite sure, you know, uh, what she was doing there. And she had this stripy dress on, so it was like purple and pink stripes. And the only thing I could think of that it reminded me of was the Cheshire Cat uh, in Alice in Wonderland. In the new version of Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat has got purple and pink stripes. And I keep, kept seeing this, kind of looking at her thinking, Cheshire Cat, thinking, what on earth does that mean? And I kept seeing like the face of the, of the Cheshire Cat kind of superimposed above her, and it kept disappearing. So it, was, it came on, and it would, it would go off, it was invisible, visible, visible, invisible kind of thing. Um, and as, as we were kind of doing the ministry time, I just said to her, and it got translated into Spanish, I just said, I just feel like God is saying, you really should be here. Her name was Chris. I said, Chris, you really should be here tonight. God's really pleased that you came here. But when you come to some things like this, you feel invisible. Um, and it feels like, you know, you're not, you don't have, a, don't have a place here. And I, as, as, as I'm speaking to you, I can see Guillermo looking at me, and he's got this big beaming smile on his face, as much as to say, that's exactly what I wanted you to say to her. Really, really fantastic. And she, you know, she started crying, then we started praying for her, and we kind of drew her all the, all the way in. And at the end, we took a selfie. Everyone took a, uh, uh, Guillermo took a thing on his camera up in the, in, the, in the air. He took a selfie of us all, and we insisted that she stood at the front of the, the group to make sure, you know, she was here for a reason. And really he kind of like cemented that you know but i thought god took me to got me to travel ten thousand miles to give a message to a poor girl on the other side of lima it really one of the, a lot of those things kept happening and thinking this is just bizarre and surreal and strange and, and wonderful what god's doing here so the whole evening went with a blast i was really really scared before we got there but i was buzzing all night on the way home <laughs> it doesn't stop there on the way home uh, we stopped in this kind of district where there's loads of casinos, there was like lots of uh, burger bars and loads of people walk, uh, standing around because in Lima it's warm in the evening, once the sun goes down, lots of crowds around. But it was a slightly kind of seedy, dodgy area thinking, oh, I'm not sure I want to hang around here too long. Uh, with the car stopped and Adam mumbled something in Spanish, got out and locked us in the car and I'm thinking, that's strange, what on earth is going on here? I so wish I'd known, I so wish I'd learned Spanish before I came. Uh, and about 10 minutes later, uh, while we're sitting, my Arthur and me sitting in the car thinking, what's going to happen next? We could get, you know, someone with a bullet uh, trying to shoot through the window. He got back in the car with this big box, put it on the uh, driver's, on the passenger seat and said, so sorry about that. He said, it's my son's eighth birthday and that's the cake for his birthday. He'd gone to pick up this cake and he'd been asked by Guillermo to come and pick us up in the taxi. He'd left his son on his eighth birthday to come and pick us up, take cakes backwards and forwards to Casa de Jesus. And he was going home to see his son to celebrate the rest of his eighth birthday. I'm thinking, oh, that is so sweet and sad and everything in there. You know, and I had all these negative feelings about uh, what, what, what was happening. It was a really, really wonderful story. Right, last story, I'll finish with this uh, click. This is uh, Juan and Magali. Uh, we went to Arequipa, which is the uh, third city down south. There's Lima, Cusco and Arequipa. Arequipa, much more British climate. 7,000 feet up in the air, in the air uh, altitude, um, rainy, temperate, lovely, just like Britain. So I lo we loved it being there, it's a real kind of a, uh, respite from the real the kind of cauldron that is Lima and we stayed with a couple called Joel and Raquel who are absolutely lovely Joel is Colombian and Raquel is the daughter of the person who the guy who planted the first vineyard in um uh in uh, Lima and they've moved down to Arequipa and they planted a church there uh they and we were stayed there for two days uh and 
uh, they were both very, very keen to introduce us to this couple they kept talking about. I didn't quite get what they were saying about this couple until much further down. And most of it happened like that way. I'd, I'd, someone would say something to me, and then two days later, I'd realize what they'd said, and it kind of didn't mean anything by then. So, so learn Spanish, Dave, learn Spanish. We went out for this meal with Joel and Raquel uh, and uh, Juan and Miguela, and they started telling us their story. Really, really sweet couple uh, sat down. He didn't, he didn't speak a word of Spanish. She uh, was pr pretty good with English, so she was translating for us all the time. Um, and they were telling us about their story. And the guy, I was sitting opposite the table from the guy, he just kept staring at me all through the mill and that kind of like slightly uncomfortable, I don't know where to look because you keep staring at me. And the fact that he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak, speak, speak Spanish, the only thing we were communicating was through kind of like eye to eye contact. I thought it's just slightly strange about this. But there was nothing offensive about them whatsoever. And they told us their story about, so 14 years ago, uh, they were in a church uh, in Arequipa and uh, the, they, they had a, a change of pastor and the, the new pastor came in and uh, they disagreed with what the pastor was doing. I didn't, I didn't quite get what the pastor was doing, but it was, wasn't something they thought the way a church should be run. So they started to challenge this guy and um, it got very, very difficult, very, very nasty uh, in, in, in the situation. Michaela worked for the church. Um, so everything kind of exploded. They were asked to leave the church. She lost her job and it, they spent kind of 14 years in a little bit of a spiritual wilderness trying to trying to find out you know because they, they thought they'd done something wrong they thought they were in the wrong they then they couldn't challenge what this guy had done there was no one to go to um and so 14 years later they're trying to lead this church elsewhere in arequipa there's a few people there and they, but they've met out with joel and raquel and they like what the vineyard is telling them they like the way the vineyard does things um i say this guy kept staring at me all the time and when i was translating when they were translating what i was saying i just felt he needed to hear that it was okay you know it's okay what he'd, what he'd been through and he needed to kind of like process it so to speak but the more we talked about it the more i could see they just they were just just really struggling with the fact that they've been chucked out of a church and the the very organization they were trying to bless and trying to to run they'd actually been th kind of thrown out of that and i really felt like they needed kind of closure and they needed to, they needed to, like to, to forgive this guy this this church leader and I just felt like God was saying to me, you need to be this, this kind of like, you know, abusive pastor and ask them for their forgiveness. So I said to them, you know, on behalf of pastors everywhere, which is a big thing to say, but I don't normally say that, but I just said to them on behalf of pastors everywhere, like the, the brotherhood of pastors, whatever that is, I said, I feel I need to ask your forgiveness for what this guy did to you. It wasn't, it wasn't right. It wasn't good what he did to you and it, and it was sin. And I feel it's very important that, that you guys, Juan and Miguel, you name that sin and you call it a sin. You say it was wrong and then you forgive this guy, which they did at the table. And it was one of the most, I'm going to cry in a minute, one of the most moving things I've ever seen just to see this guy. He just kind of like crumbled in front of us. <laughs> and it was like, you know, 14 years of grief and pain and thinking he was right, but not being sure whether he was or not. Just kind of like all kind of like descended in on him in this, in this five or 10 minutes. So we, you know, we prayed for them, we hugged, uh, I haven't seen them since. Um, but I just thought uh, afterwards, I'm thinking, oh, it would, it would be really, really good, wouldn't it? If they could bring their church so that, that they love so well, the church they're leading, this small group into the church in the Vineyard Church in Arequipa, join the two together. I mean, I don't know how that works. Sometimes that works when you do that. Sometimes it's a, it's a real car crash. I'm thinking it'd be really good because then they could get uh, blessed and fed by uh, what, um, uh, Joel and, uh, and Raquel. They could really, really be blessed by the vineyard and it will bring them right into a family that can care for them. So I'm thinking, and I also all night long, I'm kind of praying to God. I couldn't sleep that night thinking, oh, I really, really want to see them, you know, in the vineyard, Lord. What can you do about that? Um, and the following morning, <laughs> I find out that that's already happened. And the Sunday coming up, they were actually physically joining the churches together in, in Arequipa to say, we're now going to be one church. And they wanted us to actually talk to these guys just to check. We were the last check to see whether they were actually, this was a good idea to do this. So um, obviously when we kind of said we were so pleased to see them and we were so good, we prayed for them, it all kind of fitted together. So actually my prayer had already been answered. Um, that's all I've got to say about that. I will not mention the word Peru again, unless you ask me. I will not go near the subject, uh, although it's very, very dear to my heart. I don't say I don't know where it's going to go. I will go back there one day. I'm determined to take Laura, although she's not too sure. She keeps asking me how big the spiders are in Peru. I like I'm saying I didn't see a single spider. I was I was there. It's the mosquitoes you got to worry about in Peru. So. 
Um, so um, I said, I'm not going to say more of that. I just want to pray. I just want to pray for you guys. I want to pray the Holy Spirit comes and just blesses what we're doing. Laura, come and help me because I'm probably going to end up in tears in a sec. Why don't you stand up if you can and we're going to pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. Lord, it's so interesting, isn't it, where you take us to teach us things, Lord, where we have to go. And all you require, Lord, is the obedience and loyalty and just us to say yes. Just reminded of uh, Isaiah 6, where the angel says, who will go, who will go and tell my people? And Isaiah says, me, me, Lord, I'll do it. Let's just pray and see what God wants to do, shall we? I do feel the whole fear thing was a really, really important thing for me to learn. And I think because, you know, I'm one of the pastors here, I think that's for you, some of you guys as well. Often what God takes us through, he leads you through as well. So I think fear is a thing. Maybe you're facing a situation that is just scary uh, or you're a bit apprehensive or you don't know where it's going and you think, is God in this? When Dave was sharing that story about the girl who was who felt on the edge and didn't quite feel what her place was, and her name was Chris, I just felt like, and also that's also for you as well, that there absolutely mm. is a place mm. for you here. Mm. And I really, really believe that God has brought you back here mm. for such a time as this. Mm. And... Uh, just, I feel like this, the the word for you is like, get ready, get ready to, to be centre stage. That was the sense, and to be encouraged that you are, when you're here, you bring something, and when you're not here, you you there's a big gap. There's a big gap when you're not here, but you don't see that because you're not here. <laughs> uh, Jody, I just felt God was saying about there were a number of people in. Through that reminded me of you when they were worshipping. And it just, oh, it's just, it's just like Jody up there. I just want, I think God wants you to know that when you worship, it really brings something. Yeah. It's just, uh, you, you, you know, you've got a whole host of people uh, running along behind you as you enter the Holy of Holies, as you worship. You lead people into that holy place. I just need to add to that as well. I said this to you before, it, it, your voice on the internet goes out really well as well. And I think, you know, it's not just in this room, it's going out across the world as well. Your, your, your worship goes out across the world. There's some of you in here and God is calling you into leadership and you know it you know that he's calling you into leadership and it scares the pants off you and it's there's it kind of different levels of that but just you know think about that and allow god to talk to you allow god to woo you and challenge you and uh yeah that there's there's a call on you and kind of as I'm saying that, you're thinking, oh, no, oh, no. But you just know, you know if it's you, you know if it's you. Some of you are called into leading. And I just pray that God would really cement that call. There's so much for you. And Laura, I feel like as well that God is going to do some restoration in some relationships and um, you don't have to work hard to do it. I think God's going to do it. And 
like you're an absolute prayer warrior. When you pray, things happen. Um, so continue with the prayers, but know that God, not a single prayer goes unheard. And there's some restorative stuff coming. Yeah, it's almost like God's saying, do less other than pray. Don't worry about it. Uh, Di, I just feel like what you've done this morning with the Palm Sunday thing, your, cre your creativity is fantastic. And when we mentioned the building this morning, uh, th those two are linked, your creativity in this new building. He's given us this building with you, with you in mind. So I just want you to have a think about that <laughs> next month. Okay. It's a blank canvas, shall we say. <laughs> Uh, Craig, uh, I know he said it again on the uh, thing, said it's Christine, there is a place for you mm. here. I mean, you know, we've already said it in the dream today, the dream that you said, um, it's really important. And I know it's really hard for you to, to absorb that, but God keeps keep, keep saying, you know, just keep accepting it, just keep uh, believing it, just keep coming back to him and just know that, you know, there's a place here and it's an important place. And when you don't come, that, that what you bring doesn't get brought. We want, to, we want to give the opportunity for people to respond. So if the whole leadership thing resonates with you and you would like some prayer about that, we would love to pray with you. We are also, we have really overrun, so apologies. Um, but also we want to give an opportunity to um, pray for people that need healing. Uh, so if you are struggling, and it could be you're struggling with your mental health, you're struggling with depression or anxiety, or it might be that you're struggling with a physical condition, uh, but we would love to give an opportunity for you to receive some ministry. So if that's you, like the leadership thing, or you'd like some prayer for healing, then we would love to pray for you. So if that's you, then you're going to need to move your legs. One, two, three, come forward. Okay, if you, um, if you do want prayer and you haven't come forward, we're going to hang around um, at the front, come and make yourself known. We're going to formally close the service. Uh, if you uh, would like information about the Leadership College, because uh, we've got some open evenings and dates coming up about that. If you want some information about small groups, we're doing some Easter stuff uh, next Sunday. So it's a great thing to invite people to. We're going to put some information out on uh, social media this week, but that's happening next Sunday. I'm here. Check with your small group leader whether uh, your groups are on this week. But um, if you need to go, God bless you. Thanks for being with us this morning, and we will see you soon.